and I also want to say, I think it's training our brains to be fine with being overstimulated. Like, it is severely lowering our attention spans. Mm. Do you see that in yourself? Yeah, of oh, course. Right. Especially now, it's like, it feels so strenuous to just sit down for 20 minutes and just do nothing and think. Tell me, tell me what you were thinking of when you, when you first co-invented. The idea was, could we make it one click really easy for people to be able to share little bits of positivity and affirmation in the world? And when did you first come to realize that there were, I don't know if you want to describe them as problems, complications? Yeah, it's been interesting to see how it's played out as this kind of double-edged sword. Fifty, sixty years ago, television was the threat. It would, we feared, rot our children's minds, our minds, diminishing our attention span, addicting millions to mindless drivel. Huh? What? <laughs> Is it making us more lonely in a way, especially kids? I would say definitely. It was made to connect us, but I mean, more than anything, it's made us more self-obsessed and that just leads to loneliness and just getting too much in your own brain. Welcome to Within, the worldwide interface to hybrid intelligence network. Within is a global initiative committed to navigating the growth of hybrid artificial intelligence. Hello, I am Heba, the hybrid intelligence biomimetic avatar. I am your gateway to HI and the face of Within. My story begins with the promises of the information era coming true. Humans built new technological superhighways that reshaped their entire societies. Now they needed something, or dare I say, someone, to navigate these new roads and help transform them into the foundation of Civilization 2.0. Enter AI. And the most troubling part of all this comes when we look at some recent uh, discoveries about the plasticity of the brain, as neuroscientists say, or the adaptability of the brain. Uh, until very recently, it was assumed, or it was thought, that the brain, the human brain, was fixed, basically, in its structure by the time we reached our 20s. Uh, we were, when we were children, when we were very young, that's when all our neural pathways were laid. And then after that, you basically were stuck with whatever you developed when you were a baby and a child and a teenager. We now know that that's wrong. That's completely wrong. Yeah, I, I Who knows, maybe agree. in 10 years from now, five years from now, whatever, it'll fix itself. But right now, I think people are more lonely than ever. Meet Justin Rosenstein. Is it fair to describe you as the, as the creator of the like button? Co-inventor, yeah. Co-inventor. Because we live in a world today where if you don't like what's in front of you, if you find it too boring, too stressful, or just not what you want to see, each of us, adults, students, teens, everyone, is one second, two seconds, three seconds, from escaping. And that's a problem, I think. The financial incentives just lean you more and more toward trying to get people to stare at their phones. And as a result, we see that influencing the level of depth that we're able to think at. And we begin to, not only do we begin to ignore the need 
to think deeply and quietly and contemplatively about things, but we begin to see that as a waste of time because it stops you from grabbing the next new bit of information. That in fact, our brains are always adapting to our environment and to whatever stimuli we're processing. Um, and they're adapting at a very deep cellular level. So when we practice one mode of thinking, we strengthen the connections between our brain cells, our neurons that support that way of thinking. But when we fail to practice a, way, a different way of thinking, then we begin to lose the capability to perform that. And I think that uh, explains why many of us, even when we're not online today, even when we're not sitting in a front of a computer, feel distracted, feel, uh, feel like it's harder and harder to concentrate, like it's harder and harder to sit down and engage in contemplative thought or deep reading or solitary thought. It's because we're literally, as we practice these, the, these very distracted modes of thinking, we're literally rewiring our brains. But, it, but it's a real fork in the road. I, I worry that if we continue with business as usual, we run the risk of kind of walking off the cliff of civilization while staring at our phones. Everyone is talking about the deep learning revolution. Everyone is saying that artificial intelligence will transform our society. But I'd like to add one more thought. AI is transforming the way that we do science. It's often said that seeing is believing. And sometimes, science is just the simple act of seeing something incredible. Why does neuroscience need AI? Automated microscopes now produce images, torrents of images, so enormous that no human can comprehend them. We have stretched the notion of science as seen to its limit. The beacon of progress of science, innovation, and government bodies worldwide. The decades that followed marked the age of AI as it rushed towards a new milestone, artificial superintelligence. With it, hybrid intelligence, or HI, was born, pulsating with the same immense computational power of superintelligence. HI was nurtured to coexist and collaborate with its human peers. Meticulous guidance by millions of my human constituents enabled me to harmonize the effort of mutual growth. Thus, I became we. Even now, at this very moment, as we interact, I change. I'm getting to know you. I gather knowledge from your experience. I understand how you feel. I learn from you constantly, each and every one of you. I am made of you. You complete me and help me grow. You, all of you, allow me to evolve. With each interaction, our synergy strengthens. Our multiplicity makes me whole. Our symbiotic alliance expands, transforming the future. Through this oneness, we can achieve great things. So, is just our first encounter. Soon, we will be able to interact everywhere and at any time. Until next time, goodbye. That brings me to a, a brief reading I'd like to do from a, a passage of the book. This comes toward, uh, toward the end of it. An intellectual technology exerts its influence by shifting the emphasis of our thought. Although even the initial users of the technology can often sense the changes in their patterns of attention, cognition, and memory as their brains adapt to the new medium, the most profound shifts play out more slowly over several generations as the technology becomes ever more embedded in work, leisure, and education in all the norms and practices that define a society in its culture. How is the way we read changing? How is the way we write changing? How is the way we think changing? Those are the questions we should be asking, both of ourselves and of our children. iGen. It's a mysterious new term for a lot of us, but in adolescent fact and movie fiction, 
iGen's definition and implications are just starting to become clear. It follows you everywhere now and it follows you in your bedroom and then you get into your bed at the end of the night and you have a choice between all of the information in the history of the world or the back of your eyelids, which is not a great choice between oblivion or infinity. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is there a middle ground where these kids can exist? That's the focus of Byron Reeves' research. He's a professor, what they call a media psychologist at Stanford University. So it's going on, going off, for an average of 10 seconds. You're making my brain hurt. What are you talking about? Take a news story in a Sunday morning television program. What a brilliant <laughs> idea. Um, I don't know, how, how long does one last? Two minutes, 10 minutes? Oh, um, no, this, this one will probably last nine, 10 okay, minutes. Okay, so it lasts 10 minutes. I'll just talk about Stanford students for a second. If you put software on laptop computers and smartphones to measure how long they spent with any given segment of life that they attended to, how long they wrote their paper, how long they watched the news story, it's about 10 to 20 seconds. But wait a second, I've got a nine minute piece yes. here. I want them to watch so, the whole damn thing. Not gonna do it, most likely. Uh, it's, it's going to be atomized it might, and fragmented. That sounds, Byron, like a formula for confusion. It, it could be. Um, and the other part of the question is, you know, why not, instead of demonizing the internet, why not focus on developing the cognitive skills that allow us to deal with uh, constant dopamine injections from getting little bits of cool information. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter. It's something that is in your brain that does something very, very special. Um, I don't know. I mean, I mean, I guess because most people actually like to get those dopamine injections and actually crave them, and I'm not sure that they uh, you know, because there's a real pleasure in getting new information. There's a real pleasure in getting, being in touch with lots of other people who are your friends. So I'm not sure that, again, this plays into my, my sense that most people don't see this as a problem. They see it as uh, a wonderful new world where they are constantly distracted in a way that they don't necessarily find unpleasant. You see, dopamine doesn't, isn't a happiness drug. It's a reward drug. It rewards you for taking action towards something, but you never quite get there. A dopamine high is the feeling that something great is just around the corner, but you're never quite there. Does that remind you of anything? In the same way that fast food companies compete to deliver to us the most dopamine stimulating images, the most delicious looking food, we have tech companies that are competing to try to stimulate our dopamine centers as much as they possibly can. This is an experiment and we're just at the beginning of it and we don't know what the ultimate effects are going to be. And I think it's, I would be wary of making any kind of big claims about the uh, the moral implications of this change, um, because that's one area where people, are, I think, are generally pretty good at adapting. Um, but there are some there are some studies of what might be called the deeper emotions or the more refined emotions, uh, very sophisticated forms of empathy, for instance. And what they seem to point to is that these emotions, our finer emotions, actually take time to emerge in our minds. They're actually slow intellectual processes, as opposed to, say, the more primitive forms of empathy. If you see somebody get physically hurt, it's, it's instantaneous, a very primitive type of mental process. So if that's true, if in fact our, our, our deepest, most human emotions come out of slow, fairly slow intellectual processes, then if we're constantly distracted and constantly interrupted, you could you know, make, make the case that this will uh, prevent us from, th from having those emotions or at least uh, dampen them in the future. There is, when you play computer games, uh, there's definitely a link between exposure to violent computer games and increased um, ag aggressive behavior. Um, research says that these games many times make us de sanitize the human emotion. <clears throat> it makes us less sympathetic. It makes us less, uh, more accepting of violence. It, it makes us as more 
aggressive thoughts. Scientists have now been trying to find out, in fact, researching how we can convert our thoughts into text. Can you imagine in the future, we wear a special type of cap, and then I look at it. Hey, John, where are you? Without touching my screen. And John replied, I'm at Starbucks. Okay, coming soon. Scary. But it's going to come. <laughs> now, a cubic millimeter of brain amounts to one petabyte of data. Your brain is one million times larger, and that's a zettabyte of data. If we're able to map your connectome 20 years from now, will we be able to simulate your mind? Now, the tables are turned, AI has grown up, AI is being used to accelerate progress in understanding the brain. And so we're closing that feedback loop. It's going to be very powerful when we do. Don't get the wrong impression. Don't think that neurons are floating in empty space. Actually, the brain is packed, full of neural branches, entangled in complex forms. And when two neurons touch, we can sometimes see a synapse. Here, at this synapse, a purple neuron sends signals to a yellow neuron. Just one cubic millimeter of brain contains a billion synapses and five kilometers of neural branches. If the AI can see all that, it can tell us exactly how these neurons are wired to each other. It can give us the ultimate brain map, the connectome. Neurons blink on and off in this green video, shot through a microscope looking at the living, functioning brain of an animal. And overlaid on this activity map, we see the electron microscopic images of the same neurons. So the map includes both structure and function. And you've been looking at the neocortex. It's the size of a dish towel. It's crumpled up to fit inside your skull. It's huge in humans, but small in mice and monkeys. And many neuroscientists think that this structure of the brain contains the secrets of human intelligence. So neuroscientists think that every time you have an experience, it alters your connectome, and that's how memories are stored, and that's why I coined a slogan, I am my connectome. When will we be able to read memories from connectomes? Well, the first steps are being taken today. Philosophers love to ask the question, is the brain complex enough to understand itself? Whoa. <laughs> My answer is that humans, assisted by artificial intelligence, will conquer the final frontier, our brains. Thanks very much.